Sorry for the um, hesitancy in getting started. It is lovely to be with you here today on a Friday afternoon. And um, yeah, thanks to the wonderful Dee and Michelle for inviting us to be here. And I also want to acknowledge the other IAC director, Denise, who's actually part of our kind of crazy collective of change makers that is inspiring communities. Um, so this afternoon, I just wanted to share a little bit about um, our journey, some of the theories and principles and practice that have um, developed through our work um, in the last decade or so, um, and share, yeah, the power of community, but actually some of the things about the powerlessness of community that we're also noticing, because it's easy to be Pollyanna, but there's a whole lot of real-time realities that we also need to acknowledge as part of this work too, hey? Mm. So... Power of community, and it's always nice to start with a stolen slide. So I want to acknowledge Jim Dears, who is another person we've done some awesome work with over the last few years, just kind of acknowledging that there's actually things that governments can do and there's things that councils can do and there's things that lots of us can do, but actually there's some stuff that community is inherently really, really good at doing. Um, and there's huge power in that. Often we not acknowledge and step into the power that's there. Um, and that's kind of an ongoing challenge for all of us. So thinking about community, a group of people um, who identify with and support one another, um, lots of things that communities can do and lots of ways to define them. Um, I see inspiring communities as taking an intentional um, kind of lens on community of place. And for us, the potential of place was huge because it brings diverse people together. There's a common kind of identity, past, present and future that happens with place. And when we bring together those that live, care, share, work, play, study, visit, or fuck a papa or have a tribal connection to that place, it can be a really awesome vehicle for kind of setting collective visions, working out ways of working that work locally and getting some really awesome stuff done. So a little bit about Inspiring Communities as an organization, we are kind of 12 years old now. When we started back in uh, 2008, we had no idea. It was just a group of people that were passionate about community, scared that and worried that it had been left behind in New Zealand and by working together, we could make a difference. And now kind of 12, 12 years on, we've got about four and a half thousand people in a national network. Um, and we kind of see ourselves as being a bit of a backbone and a champion for community led development here in Aotearoa. So kind of four things we focus on. One is around learning, because um, actually we've had to put language and framing and describe what this thing called community-led development is. And not just what that means in, in an international sense, but right here for us here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, learning, uh, capacity building, building capability, because actually we need new tools in our toolboxes to do this work. It is a different business as usual. Thirdly, around connecting people and places and ideas and projects um, so that we don't have to all reinvent the wheels all the time. Um, and the last one is around influencing because, yeah, earlier this week, you know, we were in, in Wellington presenting alongside a government department trying to get that cross-sector collaboration going at the kind of government level. So we do what we can to knock on doors um, and at the central government level to try and change the, the conditions that enable our communities to thrive too. So community-led development, what does it mean? And you, I want to acknowledge that lots of people may have different meanings about what that term is, but I just wanted to share a little bit about what it means to us here in Inspiring Communities. So I want to anchor that within kind of three key frameworks that kind of Kendra and I will share in the next um, few minutes around and some stories around that. So um, if we think about, um, about community-led development, for us, it starts with place that I mentioned and whenua, the Māori word, the Māori, the native uh, people of New Zealand, the indigenous people, play, uh, place and whenua are incredibly important. So we start there. And when we think about that lens of place um, and overlaying uh, tangata whenua, acknowledging the indigenous people of, of our land and their passion and determination and set of values that overlays place uh, coming from their lens. Community-led development, thinking about though an and, and, and this is where the weaving of all of us start to come in. It's about the strength that um, community organisations, local residents, businesses, academics, we all have to contribute to make that place um, even better than what it is today. So that's really important for us. The important thing when we talk about place though, when we started this diagram perhaps 10, 12 years ago, it had a much stronger uh, focus on residents. But actually, we've learned that actually we can't just, you know, focus on developing the skills of residents because actually if we're not making those interconnections, we're not actually enabling the full capacity of that community to actually develop. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a mix of kind of systems change, uh, collaboration and community development within that community-led mentor. So 
the who matters, but so does the how. And this is the, the five principles that we've derived from our work here in the last kind of 10, 12 years. So community-led development, as we know, not a service or a model, um, but principles, ways of working, really important. So the five for us um, is around growing from shared local vision. So the it's are going to be different in, in Tasmania and Melbourne and Auckland and Nelson. Um, so what you do has to be driven by that local kind of context and the dreams and aspirations and the realities and the histories of that place. Secondly, working from strengths, incredibly important, using what you've got to get what you want, the ABCD a, kind of connection here seeing everyone as gifts and talents and knowing, of course, you've got to make some special efforts to involve all parts of the community because actually it's not a level playing field when it comes to participation. The third one around connecting diverse people and sectors, a lot of work in community development uh, tends to happen with like minds. <laughs> actually, the breakthroughs and community stuff is going to happen when we bring that diversity together much more intentionally, go beyond those usual suspects. Fourth, our take on leadership, incredibly important. So much leadership in community, but it sits in silos. The job of we've all got is to join that up and to acknowledge that the nannies in the street looking after the kids when they come home as much as it is the chairs of the committee. So it looks differently um, in different places, but really important. And we talk about the need for focus on uh, people, um, developing the leadership and skills of people, of good process and projects. If we just focus on the projects, we might miss the need to actually build the leadership and skills as well. The last one they're learning by doing, kind of a real a mantra for us and actually gives us permission to actually give stuff a go and encourage others to give stuff a go as well. Because as we know, in this work, you know, lots of different people, it's really messy, three steps forward, two back. You can't plan the work and work the plan like you could 10 years ago. The traditional way of doing management and project management does not fit. Uh, so yeah, learn by doing, give stuff a go, active reflection, and use, uh, make sense of what you is happening in real time with those that you're working with to work out what your next step needs to be. Um, so that's the theory. And I just wanted to hand over to Kendra for some stories of kind of what this stuff looks like in practice. Cool. Okay, so this feeds nicely into, you know, what Tony and uh, DeWatt were saying as well about wanting to understand some local stories and how does it look like on the ground for all sorts of people. So here's a few stories uh, and um, grassroots movements. So they're numbered here. So I'll start at number one. Um, but we're always remembering that, you know, CLD, community-led development, is unique to the people and the places that, you know, they come from. And there's often different combinations of the people, whether they're, like, uh, the map that we just saw, the weaving map that we saw, whether they're residents or council people or a funder or a business organisation. So there's this lovely mixture of um, what we might think about as, uh, and sometimes as hapu led. So a, a whānau is an extended family and a hapu is a collection of whānau. Um, you know, that might be happening in, in somewhere like Northland. We've got suburban level things going on in places like Manurewa and Randwick Park and many other cities across South Dunedin, really lovely examples of whole suburb areas working together. And then it could be like a sector working together um, that might be focusing around kai, uh, food, or it might be focusing around youth employment or the sport and recreational um, activities or community health and wellbeing. So just going to these photos and speaking to each of them, um, so it never looks the same. Now, all of these are really lovely examples of CLD in action. So up on number one there, we've got what's called a pataka kai uh, in Te Reo, meaning a storehouse for food. So these people um, gather a little um, of excess of things that they've got and can put it into a place that's like a little community library, but in this instance, it's about food. And so it's about sharing and making stuff available easily. And number two, you know, just a classic family fun day. Um, this one was in Massey in West Auckland. And then number three, you know, neighbours coming together to open up a community hub and actually working on one and helping it, and, you know, actually happening. Looks like they're putting a stage in or something in there in, in a community hall. Migrant woman and number four, um, being supported um, to run small micro sort of social enterprises. 
This one's in Eden Park in Auckland. And um, number five, um, you know, neighbours repairing and brightening up their streets, and this one's in Eden Terrace, like a big, you know, blank concrete wall. It's like, okay, we know all about how we can sharpen that up. And then a repair cafe. This is in Takapuna on the North Shore in Auckland, where people come together and learn how to do stuff and help each other out. And it's that whole thing about empowering. So it's that can do, next slide, thanks, Megan. You know, it's that can do a spirit of Kiwi communities. Um, slides not moving, yeah, there we go. Um, the can do, uh, sorry, this is about, um, this is a lovely story about, um, you know, a can do attitude in, in a potiki, which is in the Bay of Plenty in the North Island and, and here in New Zealand, where iwi, um, so there's, Fano and then Hapu and then Iwi is like the tribal group of that whole area. Um, a really good CLD project there, which was very much about Iwi and the council working with the uh, sorry with the community about looking forward to sort of turning local dreams of economic and social transformation into a real um, is a really lived economic model of reality and thanks to multi-sector sort of collaborative partnerships and investment so a potiki you know it's small small town New Zealand now boasts one of New Zealand's largest offshore mussel farms so a really big enterprise eight as you can see the boat going out there from the harbour eight kilometers they go off the coast um, of a potiki they go down 3,000 metres under the sea and there are 175 lines growing for premium mussels to be exported. So local jobs and optimism is one thing, but actually having all that investment from those a range of stakeholders means a hugely more positive future for the whole town. So now they've got that going, they're, they're turning their attention to developing a whole um, next level of skills development, that sort of workforce readiness, and, and also looking at how they're going to house those people as they need more and more to run this organ um, to run this enterprise. So the first new job that they created with this whole project was in 2017. And um, that's a single job which sort of got that enterprise going and now they're employing 90. And it's now contributing to this multi million harbour re redevelopment that's going on with 160 new positions over the next 18 months. So it's hugely significant that kind of leeway, uh, iwi are kind of leading this to some degree and, um, and that they're drawing on all the schools of people in this town and it's going to be absolutely transformative. So it's that really thinking outside the square of how you can harness, harness the people into that long-term future. Another learning opportunity here about um, uh, a real another can-do spirit of you know so some projects can be really small and some works can be really big um, what we do know is that when it works well that even though you start with a one idea let's do this that it can quite often spring out into many other um, uh, opportunities and possibilities um, this is um, from small town um, in small place called Natia, which is in the Hauraki Plains, which is um, Megan's home, home ground where she grew up. Very um, intensive farming there over the years meant a really increased demand for some employees with a much greater range of skills. And so they decided that they would start to custom train a whole lot of local kids. So they started with some community meetings of upwards of 100 people to design some programs, identify the farmers who they could work and become the trainers. And the program has gone on from strength to strength. There's now over 150 kids involved in a really highly skilled and highly successful agricultural academy based on this thing called the Hauraki and Charitable Trust. They called on lots of resources again from the wider community to help grow this bigger infrastructure that they needed to create the training program. Local kind of leaders and business um, movers and shakers and local farmers and businesses and you know all those lovely old boy networks. And back in 2006, they raised over a million dollars in equity to purchase this farm and the stock so that the academy kids could then actually put what they were learning into really practical um, lived reality. 
Uh, they then sold that one, and they've in turn now purchased a, a, a big, a much bigger farm. And in 2019, they had over 320 cows being milked every day. So now that starts generating more and more income. And so one thing has led to the other of the enterprise itself really generating a whole new, um, not just the academy, but you know, a bigger farm and more resources and more kids that can come through the program. So some really nice, you know, down to earth on the get your fingernails in the in the earth um, stories. Another one is um, Southland Charitable Hospital. And this all came out of um, following one guy from Winton, small town Southland, right down the bottom there, a guy called Blair Vining, who was diagnosed with a really um, difficult terminal um, bowel cancer in 2018. And after experiencing firsthand, um, you know, the New Zealand healthcare system, he realised he needed to do something about it. So he left behind um, his worries about um, his bowel cancer and decided that he could set up a Southland Charitable Trust. So the whole of the story of this beginning of, you know, initial focus on colonoscopies, because that was relevant, and dentistry, because that was an ongoing issue in that area, lots of people now contributing. And they have now raised over 4.5 million to renovate a former tavern into um, the site for this um, hospital. And medical professionals from all around the country now are offering to do stints, you know, right there. So there's this lovely sense that, you know, community can be the driver of solutions, always looking onwards. So we'll jump past the other couple of stories, but look at how... Over these years, Megan and the team have been leading this whole process of how can we make sense more and more of how change happens and over time. So, you know, we're often, um, you know, looking at the top there, things often start from a loose, what we might call a loose connection. It might be Blair going, you know, I can see some real issues with this medical system. I wonder who I could talk to. And so he goes to something and, or someone, and he develops this kind of capacity to act. Is there some people we could talk to? And there, is this a good idea for us to pursue an opportunity? So any of these projects would have started this way. And it might start with a loose connection and go on to capacity to act and go around the wheel. But it's also, it might be that you go back and make some other loose connections and draw people in. So there's this model that, that we're sort of, feeling like it starts to show how sometimes a project can follow pathways and sometimes they can tip and, and slide and come and go from each of these places of, from loose connections to acting to organizing and collaborating and then sometimes growing out way beyond that original vision but always 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 holding at the heart of it is these principles I sometimes think of them as almost like values. The things that we value the most are these principles that sit right at the heart of it all. Back to so you, I think. <laughs> Sorry, go on, Megan. We've probably only got another couple of minutes, so I'm just going to skip over some stuff, but happy to come back to it. I just wanted to share some reflections about the power of community and the powerlessness of community, because holding both at this moment uh, together is really important. So I think we saw here in New Zealand, you know, and you will have seen it in your own places, kind of we had very, very major lockdowns here for long periods of time. Um, and we refer in New Zealand to the team of five million and how we got in behind that. So, you know, small population, um, you can do, you can think about teams of five million um, in some kind of smaller scale. But actually what happened um, during that time when the systems got completely disrupted, some new ways of working happened. And we did a really great piece of work last year documenting what those kind of systems changes um, were at the time. Um, and the stories from community were really powerful. So we went from we can't, there are rules to yes, we can, and stuff just happened. It was really powerful. And like you, lots of aspirations about, gosh, we've seen what this can look like. We can do more of it now. We're going to have all these great systems change changes as a result and here's the report that gives you the, the, the kind of systems shifts um, amazing stories of what communities did over those times but actually and here's the systems shifts that we came up with but have they really made a huge difference before I do my little moan to finish with I just wanted to reflect on the things that we still think are important for community power to be kind of maximized and it's this notion of the importance and decentralization and actually getting things down to that smallest level possible wow 
people can be really, yeah, the very lo local, the hyper-local is really, really important. And in New Zealand context, a big step is to do that regionally, but it's just still way too big, right? We know that at that scale of four to 6,000, some magic kind of happens and even smaller, even better. So decentralizing really important. Recognizing and respecting difference. You know, it's not a one size fits all. And if you want to enable equity, you need diversity in what things look like. But, um, that's been really important. Um, valuing people and relationships. The stuff where things happen fastest and responses with COVID has been where relationships have been. And you can't create them when you don't have them in a fast paced way. So we need to be reinvesting and, and, and really focusing on more relational ways of doing things and embedding collaboration. Because if we've got a way of working, it enables us to know really quickly who to go to to make things happen. Tolerating more risk. There's some lovely quotes in the report that talk about actually, you know, Nothing bad really happened when we gave stuff a go. You know, yeah. rule breaking doesn't to be the end of the world. And this notion of actually joining up social and economic in place. Mm. And it's made me think about, um, yeah, we were really optimistic last year that, you know, um, because of that and we could demonstrate the power of communities that things were going to change at a kind of systems level. But actually, has it? Some trends that kind of scare me, there's lots more use of community-led development language out there, lots of government departments and others and councils picking it all up. But actually, there's a, there's a business of usual change that's really inherent in this work, and we've actually got to do things differently. So one of Denise's favourite cartoons that I love as well is, you know, this one about, you know, you can't talk about change with actually doing it. So really interested to hear from your perspectives about how that's landing in your places, um, and, and how we can weave that dance of power and powerlessness back to power again to make a real difference. No doubt from my kind of last 15 years, you know, we can't do this stuff without community. We need to be better at making room for it and for enabling it and supporting it. Um, and that requires a, a hell of a lot of bravery and a hell of a lot of courage. And I guess for 2022, looking into that space, we're also in that context of division that's happening. Uh, the vaccinated, the unvaccinated, how you hold inclusion and uh, community safety um, and, and the impacts that are having there. So that's a bit of a, a Friday afternoon end of, end of rant for me and I'm going to open it up now. But yeah, keen to think about and hear about what's, what's the kind of balance of power and powerlessness you're seeing. Thanks, Megan and Kendra. I know it's really hard. It's 20 minutes. There's so much more I'm sure you could share. So um, I, I'd just like to be really transparent as well that I don't have to leave on the hour. Like if people want to stay another 10 minutes, if Megan and Kendra can, I'm, yeah. I'm open to that. But um, yeah, open to the floor uh, if people have some questions or put them in the chat, um, whichever you would prefer. So please share. I'll just stop the recording now.